So in this video, we're finally going to start talking about laser output power. So how much power can we actually squeeze out of a laser for a given current? Uh, this is also known as the laser's Li curve. Uh, and we're going to do this using our rate equations. So we have our photon rate. First, we have our carrier rate equation, which tells us for a given level of current, uh, what is my carrier density? And then from there, we can plug in, essentially plug in that result into our photon rate equation. And this will tell us how much output power we can get. Uh, and so in this video, well, in the next couple videos, we're going to analyze two different regimes, uh, if you like, of uh, qualitatively different regions of operation of the laser. Uh, one is we, where we have a low current. And I'll, mean what I'll, I'll explain what exactly I mean by low in, in a couple videos. In this case, we're dominated, our output power is dominated by uh, spontaneous emission. So our laser is essentially acting like a really crappy LED. Uh, not, not entirely, there's some subtle differences. It, one it has to multiply by a factor of beta SP, and there's a, a couple others. But uh, this is what the laser is acting like when we have a low current. Uh, the other is where we have a high current, and we can no longer neglect stimulated emission, uh, then stimulated emission becomes our dominant factor. And this is generally what we're interested in. This is where our laser is acting like a full-blown laser, and we're able to sustainably generate uh, those oscillations inside a cavity that we were talking about before. So first, let's start with our carrier rate equation. And let's say that for now, we're just interested in the steady state uh, laser operation. So we're not interested in if we apply, for example, a step function of current, uh, how the laser responds transiently to that. For now, we're only interested in we apply some constant current, uh, so some current that's not a function of time, what is our output power? And once we know this, we can generalize to a case where we've got transiently applied signals. So let's start with our carrier rate equation, which we said previously was just dn dt, where n is our carrier density that we're used to dealing with in semiconductor physics. Uh, this is just equal to this injection efficiency eta i uh, times the current divided by q times the active region volume, so the, the volume that is actually able to accept these carriers. And then from this we needed to subtract the total uh, so recombination from all sources within the active region. Now, if we're interested in steady state, the derivative doesn't change with time. So this just becomes zero. And this is now the equation that we're interested in solving. And so this is nice and simple. And we, let's rearrange it just so that it's even simpler. Uh, so the total recombination from all sources is just equal to this term. Now, in terms of actually calculating meaningful quantities like output power, uh, what we're most interested in in this equation is our spontaneous emission and our stimulated emission. Oh, that's, that's not S, that's RS, or R sub stim. Uh, so these are the two that we're most interested in. And uh, for now, we're going to assume that we're, we have a low amount of current. And so I'm going to neglect the stimulated emission. So in that case, the total recombination, uh, we can just write as our ABC approximation. So if we're neglecting stimulated emission, uh, if we weren't, then we'd add it in here as well. And this ABC approximation, this contains a stimulated emission term. So this is uh, rewriting it just as the its subcomponents. This is just shockley reed hall recombination plus spontaneous uh, recombination plus OJ recombination. And this can be written as A times the carrier density plus B carry density squared plus C carry density cubed. And this was covered in a previous video. And we're interested in extracting primarily this term because this is the term that's relevant to output power. This is a useful optical power that we get out of this recombination. We don't get anything useful out of Auger or shockley reed hall recombination except for heat, uh, which we're, we're not a huge fan of generally. It's, it's not terribly useful. And so we're just going to play a little trick uh, to make this equation as simple as possible. We're going to multiply everything by the spontaneous recombination rate and divide everything by the total recombination rate. And then we've got something that looks like this. 
So now we've got eta i, i over q times the active region volume. And I'm just gonna call this uh, eta spontaneous. So this is our, uh, also known as our spontaneous recombination efficiency. And you might protest, you might be like, well, uh, didn't, isn't that a function of n? Like, wasn't that something we were trying to solve for here? Uh, and you'd be right, uh, and I apologize for this, but this is, generally we can treat uh, eta spontaneous as a constant. And this is often actually, uh, this is fairly easy to empirically measure, uh, and it's fairly easy to calculate. So we, we treat it as a constant that's not a function of carrier density, and that makes our lives much easier. So if we can rewrite the entire equation now as these two different efficiencies, uh, times i over q times our active region volume. And yeah, this is a bit of a hack, uh, but it makes things conceptually easier to deal with because if we pretend that we know this spontaneous recombination efficiency, and we generally do, uh, or we can measure it, then this, uh, this set of equations becomes much easier to deal with. And I might make a video on uh, eta spontaneous in the future, uh, but it essentially allows this equation to at least seem like it's independent of carrier density. All right, now that we, now that we know the dependence on current from the carrier rate equation, we can move to the photon rate equation. So dNP dt, and this is the number of photons, the number of photons rather than the photon density, simply because that's easier to work with. And this was equal to, what do we say um, before? Vg times G times the number of photons plus this beta spontaneous term times R spontaneous times the active region volume minus the number of photons divided by the photon lifetime. Uh, and there is one subtlety in this equation, and that's that if our entire device, uh, if it's composed of some active region and that's embedded in some other material, uh, then we actually need to multiply this first term, which has to do with stimulated emission by gamma because we actually don't have, rather than just the number of, the total number of photons interacting, so we've got a certain number of photons inside the active region volume interacting with the active region to produce gain, now we've also got some photons outside the active region that aren't doing anything useful. And so we need to multiply this stimulated emission term out front by gamma. But I said we were gonna ignore stimulated emission, so that won't really matter until the next video. Uh, and we're also interested again in steady state, so we can set this whole thing equal to zero and rearranging it uh, in terms of the number of photons. So we just move this term over to the left-hand side, multiply everything by tau p. Uh, we get that this is just equal to this beta spontaneous term times tau p times r spontaneous times v active. And we know r spontaneous, we just calculated it previously. Uh, so we can plug that in here and we get the total number of photons in our cavity. So I'm going to put all the efficiencies out front. So eta i, eta spontaneous, and you can think of beta spontaneous as an efficiency as well. It's the, like the fraction of photons we're able to inject into the mode. And then this is, uh, now we've got what, uh, an active region volume from the original NP and then an I over Q times the active region volume. And that's nice, our active region volumes cancel. And so we've got our final equation. Let's just erase those. For our photon, our total number of photons in the cavity. Oh, and it looks like I left out a tau p here. There we go, there you are. Now, once you know the total number of photons in the cavity, you really know everything there is to know. because. Uh, well, let me, let me complete that cavity. So we've got a bunch of photons floating around or bouncing around more precisely in this cavity. And if we want to calculate the total output power, uh, all we need to figure out is how many photons are leaking out of this cavity per unit time. And uh, let's just assume that they're all leaking out of one side so that we get the power all out of, all out of one side, although that's not strictly speaking correct. We can calculate the power if we just know the energy of the photon uh, and the number of photons escaping per unit time. 
And we've calculated this before. This was just uh, given by our photon lifetime. So the number of photons in the cavity divided by our photon lifetime. And so if we multiply the exp this expression by our photon energy, and let's just write that as h bar omega so that we can be, be standard, um, we'll get that the output power, since we're dividing this whole thing by tau p, this is gonna cancel with this photon lifetime. And this is just equal to now our efficiencies, so eta i, eta spontaneous, beta spontaneous, times the photon energy, h bar omega, uh, and let's just divide that by q, multiplied by the current. So I know this might be starting to look a little like the Drake equation, uh, but basically we've got an output power which is proportional to some coefficient, which depends on the photon energy uh, and all these various efficiencies, but it's linearly proportional to the power. So if I were to draw the output power as a function of current, it might look something like this. So it's just going to be a straight line. So this is the current that we're injecting, and this is the output power. Uh, now there's one caveat, uh, and this is the output power into our lasing mode. So it's not necessarily the total output power of the laser or the total spectrum across all wavelengths, uh, but it's at the specific wavelength or near the specific wavelength that our cavity uh, th that has our cavity mode, so the, the mode that we're generally interested in. And this is what generally interests us in lasers because this is what's generally uh, useful for us. Now, if you do want to calculate the total spectrum of the laser below threshold, uh, you basically just need to calculate the total spectrum of an LED uh, because that's what this is. And we'll go over that in future videos. Uh, one last caveat I should make. This was also ignoring any internal losses. So in general, we might have some internal losses inside our laser cavity, or more, more likely outside of our active region. So maybe this is our active region. This let's call our cladding. We might have some loss in the cladding, and so we lose some photons here that never make it outside. And so if we wanted to include that, we could just multiply this uh, by another efficiency. Uh, let's call that, I don't know, uh, eta, what do you guys, what do you guys want to call it? Eta C for eta cladding? I don't know. There's, I don't think there's a standard. Actually, I lied. There is a standard. This is, I just looked it up. This is called eta D. Eta D. Shows you how much I use that. So I hope you liked the video. Uh, if you did, please give it a like below and subscribe to my channel. Uh, also, if you have any questions or comments, please post those down below and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. And thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.